You're my defender You're my refuge in the storm Through this triumph You have And Father, we come to you, Lord, and ask that you would speak to us at this time, God, because we need you, and we can't do anything without you. And Father, we thank you for the truth of this song that we, no one in the building, is ever alone. Even if we're in a room by ourselves, we're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have Christ in us. We have the Father, the ever-present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, Lord that you designed this life where we never will never be alone you said never will I leave you nor will I forsake you so father the one who is here right now Jesus Christ you are here and on your throne Holy Spirit you're living in every believer we pray God that you would simply have your way speak to us Lord help us to understand the Word of God today help us Lord not to escape the purpose as to the reason why you came to this earth Lord, that we will glorify you and that we will lift you up. Lord Jesus, we recognize that without you, there's nothing that can be accomplished. So God, I pray that you will forgive us, Lord, for any times in which we say, think, or do that doesn't please you so that we can be clean vessels to receive the word of the Lord today. God, we pray that you would continue to work in our hearts and help us to know that you're with us through every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. probably have an idea of what the message is about today it's what's called Palm Sunday and when they laid down palm branches before Jesus Christ so we're gonna look at the Word of God and understand more of what took place why it took place and how does it impact us today what took place why did it take place and how is it gonna impact us today the question really is who is he and the Word of God is very clear as to who Jesus Christ is and the whole purpose as to what took place that week before Jesus Christ, a few days, days before Jesus Christ would die on the cross. So we need to look at God's Word together. But before we do, there's something that I need to share with you. I was walking and then I had slipped this wasn't the time I slipped recently. This was a while back. I had slipped and I had fallen on my left shoulder, which left an injury. Some bursitis and some where the, the tendon is sore on the inside. And had this problem with my left shoulder where I couldn't lift it up all of the way. As time went on, I then was skiing with my nephew and decided to take up snowboarding for the first time, which was a lot of fun, by the way, much more fun than skiing. Once you get it, it takes a while to get it. 
So the thing about skiing or snowboarding is you need at least 72 hours, at least three days so that you can stay up and not fall down. You need at least three days. So if you tried skiing and you didn't get it the first day, that's quite normal. You don't get it the first day, the second day, by the end of the third day, you feel better. So snowboarding is different, and I'm so glad that I purchased these uh, wrist guards, because if not, I probably would have broke my wrist, because snowboarding is totally different. Skiing, you could, you could fall down skiing gracefully, right? Like you could go down, boom. Snowboarding throws you down in a flash. Like in 0.5 seconds, you could be up, and then you hit the blade wrong in the, in the snow, and it's whack, you just, just go down really hard. My nephew was making fun of me because I wasn't keeping up with him. Now we're both learning, but he was obviously getting it quicker than I was. And so he was making fun of me, and so he was in front of me, and he was going, and then the edge caught. And as the edge caught, his face literally planted in the snow, like whack hard on his face. Now malice is something whereby you rejoice when somebody else gets hurt. So I had a whole lot of malice that day because he was getting on my nerves about how I wasn't keeping up with him. Snowboarding is a difficult sport. So what happened on that time, I, felt, I remember falling back and I heard something sort of like rip inside here, like a muscle or something, as I fell back, landing on the same shoulder. That led to about two years of physiotherapy. I'm talking about ultrasound, physiotherapy, this doctor, another specialist, more physio. I'm making all these physio appointments. I have to go once a week, and I have exercises. I have bands. I have a taped back. All that stuff. Went through all of that for about two years. Then I went to, we went to Taiwan one summer, and Nicole, my sister-in-law, says, hey, why don't you go and see my chiropractor there in Taipei? So I said, okay. So I went there, not even forgot almost about this shoulder thing. And then he went there, and you know, many times in the West, you go to a chiropractor, you're in the office, and you're out in 10 minutes. He takes about 45 minutes to make sure uh, that you get adjusted properly. It's a 45 minute thing. They relax the muscles before they even start to adjust the, the bones and so on. So I went through all of this, and then I said, oh, by the way, my, 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 my shoulder's been hurting for a while. So I'm doing this all through translation with Bell, and of course, I'm not speaking Chinese, and so it's just translating for me. He doesn't speak English. And so he says to her in Chinese, I was telling him what was happening and where the problem was. He says to her in Chinese, ask him, what's his pain tolerance? Bell says he wants to know what your pain tolerance is. I'm like, so what does that mean? I said, I guess we're going to find out. So the problem was here in the muscles here and under here, which he knew what the problem was. And so what he had to do was reset my muscle. So check this out. You know, muscle memory is really important. For sports, it's extremely important. The reason why Tiger Woods can hit that swing consistently is because of muscle memory. Why Serena Williams can go and give that serve each time is because of muscle memory. So muscle memory for Messi, the football player, and others is extremely important because once you gain muscle memory, that's what makes you good at the sports, whatever sports you're doing. You need it for tennis, you need it for golf, you need it for swimming. Your muscles remember, you train them. That's why physical exercise and practice over and over and over again for gymnasts and those of you into gymnastics, you need muscle memory to know how to flip. I was watching ice skating just last night for a little bit and saw this person. Did you see anybody see that? And I said, this person, how they flip around and go and do And you say, you go and try it and see what happens. Just try it. It will not work, will it? Because you need the muscle memory. You need to put into practice with that. So what happens is when you have an injury, your muscles remember and compensate and remember how to adjust in regards to the injury, and they get so used to doing that, they forget how they should function normally. So he says, what's your pain tolerance? Guess we're gonna find out. He took this, this blunt object, you know, like a shoehorn that was sort of blunt, and he literally attacked my shoulder, and he started digging into that, and then all underneath here, now I'm quite, dark skin, but when I saw, looked in the mirror and I was completely red, 
I'm like, that's deep. So he's up there and he's digging up here and doing that. And then I saw him like sort of, he took the, the smooth part of it and sort of like brushing the muscles down. And he was explaining that your muscles, I'm causing your muscles to forget what they're doing now so that they can adjust how they properly should be. He says, you're going to be sore for one day and then it should get better. I'm thinking to myself, it ain't no way I'm going to get better because I am so bruised up. I looked in the mirror the same day, bright red. I got up the next morning, and the redness was gone. And for the first time, I could rotate my shoulder completely. And I am telling you this. Two years of physiotherapy in the West, one visit with this chiropractor in Taipei, and I was healed. I was like, this is, we need to bring this stuff over to Bermuda. Like, what you doing next week? So he said, don't worry, you'll be okay. You should be fine. You shouldn't have the problem again. He did what he had to do and was completely a done deal. And I was thinking to myself, how many of us, spiritually speaking, need our muscles reset as to how we think about God, as to how we think about Jesus, as to how we think about the Bible? Because this type of message today is a muscle reset. So what's your pain tolerance? Because there's some things you might have to let go of when we look at this particular topic. This topic as to the reason why Jesus Christ had come and these prom branches are coming is what we need to look at. So first of all, some background to the passage. Jesus is about to die on the cross in about a week. But most don't know that. Neither do they understand it. In fact, his very own disciples are not understanding the fact that Jesus Christ has to die on the cross. Jesus Christ went to his disciples and he says, hey, listen, I need to tell you something that I need to. He was sort of telling them there at the Last Supper a little bit of what had to take place and what had to go on. And they weren't having it. The second thing is that Jesus is showing everyone right now, especially in this last week, he's showing everybody who he is. When the life of Christ first started, when the, the ministry of Jesus Christ was lasted for about three years, three plus, about three years in which it lasted, remember at the beginning of his earthly ministry, he would say to people as he healed them, I healed you, but don't tell nobody. You got it? Don't tell anybody that I was the one who did it. Why? Because he didn't want people to know. Why? Because people's hearts weren't right. They weren't ready to receive it. And he knew that if he revealed all of who he was right up front, he probably would have ended up on the cross earlier. But he had to do it in the fullness of time on that Passover when the time was right to become the ultimate Passover, the ultimate Lamb of God. But Jesus is showing everyone now in this last week who he is. And one of the ways in which he does it is by the resurrection of Lazarus. When Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, and Jesus Christ resurrected him, Jesus Christ knew exactly what he was doing because people were around there. Other times when Jesus Christ was raised the dead, he would even tell everybody, get out of the room. Go out. Everybody go out. Just, just sleep and go out. And he'll go there, and just the uh, disciples and the parents will be there, and he will raise up the person. In this case, he did something so public and if you track the word of God and the life of Christ, you will recognize this. It wasn't until the resurrection of Lazarus that the chief priests and the teachers of the law said, that's enough. We have to kill him. They vowed to kill him after the resurrection of Lazarus and said, we just need to find a way as to how we're going to do it. But here's, here's a dead duck. We're not putting up with this guy any longer. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. We're done with this guy. And everybody in Jerusalem, there's an uproar. Everybody in Jerusalem is talking about this resurrection because so many people saw it. And it's just traveling throughout the country. And keep this in mind, Passover is on the way. Do you realize when Passover comes, there's people that come from all around the world, especially the Jews that are living in other countries, they come in order to worship the Lord. So Jerusalem goes from a smaller population to over just Jerusalem, not even the outskirts, goes to two, over two million people during this time period, even in the first century, as Passover was approaching. 
So there's lots of people that are around, and they're there, people in Jerusalem from different parts and different nations, because why? This thing called Passover is coming up, but there's a prelude to it, and as people are coming and arriving into the city, they're hearing about Jesus of Nazareth. He resurrected a guy named Lazarus. No. Yes, he did. I know this guy is from my town. I was the guy who helped bury him. I was the guy that wrapped him in the cloth. He was there. I was the guy that smelled him. He stunk. I'm telling you, it was for real. All these witnesses were there testifying that Jesus Christ is for real. So chapter 21 now says in Matthew's Gospels, as they came to Jerusalem to Bethpage and on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. This is an area that's just outside of Jerusalem. In fact, it's on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Keep this in mind that important people, as they entered the city, would go through the eastern gate, which is known as the Golden Gate as well, which today is all sealed up. But this is the place where royalty will go through. Jesus Christ approached Jerusalem, and he comes to the place, not Bethany, but Bethpage, which is about northwest of Bethany, on the Mount of Olives. Keep in mind, Bethany is the place where he did the resurrection of Lazarus. On the Mount of Olives, which is the mountain that is right there before you enter the city, you have to go to the Mount of Olives. You go down the Kidron Valley, you go from the Mount of Olives, down the Kidron Valley, up into Jerusalem city. So he's coming from this place called Bethpage, which is coming there on the Mount of Olives. And he sort of stops as he's coming from Bethany, coming through, going to Jerusalem. He sends two disciples and says, I want you to go and do something. Saying to them, he said, go to the village ahead of you. And once you find a donkey tied there with her coat by her, untie them and bring them to me. A donkey which is the mother and her coat, the baby donkey that's right there, the little younger donkey, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Somebody, they stop, hey, what are you doing with my animals? You can't tell. The Lord needs them. Okay, not a problem. Go ahead. Jesus, yeah, no problem. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 is what's being quoted here. Jesus Christ is saying, this is what will fulfill what's spoken through the prophet. Say to, the, say to daughter Zion, that's to Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you gentle, the word for gentle or humble, and doing what? Riding on a donkey and on a coat, the foal of a donkey. So this Jesus is saying, I need this because I'm going to ride on top of it. But notice what he says here. See your, what's the next word? King. King. That's the whole theme of the Bible. Brian and I were talking about this just this past week. And I was saying, that's what the message is going to be on in regards to what's going to take place today. And also for next week. See your king comes to you. Gentle. And riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foot of a donkey. So Jesus Christ is saying, I need to ride on a donkey. A donkey was symbolic of service. It was symbolic of labor. It was also a symbol of humility and a symbol of peace to come on a donkey. Kings sometimes would do this to show that they are with the people, that they are humble to be with the people, even as kings, as sometimes they would come on a donkey instead of a horse. Horse usually means war, usually means judgment. So it's best that you know Jesus Christ on the donkey rather than just to know Jesus Christ who is coming on the horse, because he's coming to do some damage when he comes on the horse. Now he's coming in service and in humility and in peace. He says, see, your king is coming to you. So what's been downplayed is the kingdom of God. This is probably what led Tony Evans to write the kingdom agenda, because the church had moved so far away from the whole idea of kingship. But we need that muscle reset today. It's all about the kingdom. The kingdom of God appears 68 times in 10 New Testament books. 
I think God wants us to understand that this is the theme. The second thing is that the kingdom of heaven also appears 32 times, but only in the gospel of Matthew. They use the term kingdom of heaven most likely because it's a Jewish audience that would identify with that term more than kingdom of God. But they're both synonymous because if you study the scriptures and you look at the comparison of the verses that are applied in which the same context and the same words are used, the only difference is heaven and God. So some will use the kingdom of God and others will use kingdom of heaven, but one in the same. So 68 plus 32, you can do the math as to how many times the Lord continues to say like a hundred times that it's about the kingdom of God it's about the kingdom of heaven now this whole idea of kingdom comes from even the time period of David this is what God said to David he says let's read it together are you ready here we go your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me your throne will be established forever which means it will never have an end. This was what was so profound about the prophecy that was given to David's throne was that David's throne will never end. The king that's appointed by the Lord God, David's throne will never end. So he's talking about the line of David and the throne of David will never end because there's one that's coming that was often called the son of David, his name is Jesus Christ because he's in the direct line of King David. You can see that in regards to the genealogy that's given even in Matthew, in regards to the line of Jesus Christ as it goes from Adam and it goes all the way down and right down through David's line right to Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the son of David. When they scream out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Your house, David, your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is God speaking to David. Why? Because Jesus Christ is king. We know he's called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. This was Herod's greatest concern and fear. After Jesus was born in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to worship him and asked what? Who is he that is born? What's the next four words? King. Shout it out again. King. king of the what? Who is it that's born the king of the Jews? Because we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in old Jerusalem with him. Why? Because it's the king. I'm the king of the Jews. Who's this other guy? Talking about, he's the king of the Jews. So right from the beginning, and the reason why you had all of those murders that took place, because he was trying to annihilate those that were born as two-year-olds, is because of the fact that he was threatened, as he was many times. King Herod was a great architect, but he was also very paranoid. He would even take out his own family, if necessary, if they felt that they were threatening his throne. So where is this guy that's born the king of the Jews? This was the reason for his execution. Remember Pilate then went back inside when he is there a week later inside the palace, summoned Jesus days later and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Because now Pilate has to make a decision. Do I turn him over to be crucified or not? I'm find nothing wrong with it. So is this what this is all about? So you're the king of the Jews. Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Don't you love how Jesus handles himself? Don't you wish you could think this quick? Is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priest handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, your servants will fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then. So you are a king then. Pilate had the question, who is Jesus? Many people today are asking the same question. Who is Jesus Christ? It's a very important question because it determines eternal salvation, doesn't it? As to who do you believe Jesus Christ is? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. A lot of Bermuda is about who you know. You realize that? And that's not always a bad thing. I was thinking about this because it's such a small community. When you need certain things done, sometimes you need to call somebody who works for a certain place in order to get something accomplished. Do I have an amen? amen. It works. And so what happens is that I was thinking salvation is the same way. It's all about who you know. Because if you know the Lord, then the Lord knows you. That's an important thing because then you get stuff done. 
things in heaven can take place on earth. All about who you know. But you have salvation. It's all about who you know as well. So in this case, he says, listen, who are you? Are you a king? My kingdom is not of this world. In John chapter 19, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross, which read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, because this was the reason for the crucifixion, because he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And that was the leverage that these chief priests used and said, listen, let me tell you something, Pilate. You want to sit on the fence on this one? Well, let me tell you, if you allow this guy to go free, then surely you're no friend of Caesar. Because Caesar is the number one authority. But if you say that he's the king of the Jews, then we're Caesar. You're no friend of Caesar. And you see the political pressure that they used in order to get Pilate? It was all about the kingship and kingdoms. And so he says, many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. God even had it written in three languages. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's the reason why he's being placed on the cross. It's a messianic prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the what? The government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Messianic titles that are given to the one who is coming, the child that is born in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government shall be upon his shoulders, which means the king is going to reign and take over all other governments. Now, the devil knew this. This was the whole theme of why Jesus Christ was coming, was because God wanted to set up his kingdom, because keep in mind, people are not following the Lord. So how is he going to bring in his kingship? He's going to bring it in through Jesus Christ. That was the great mystery, through the Messiah that was going to come. And they knew about the Messiah. The Jews knew that a Messiah was coming. They knew that a king was coming. They knew that someone's going to be appointed to deliver them from all governments, including Rome. But they had no idea as to how Jesus was going to, how God was going to do it, which messed them right up. So keep this in mind that everybody knows. In fact, remember when Jesus, got, Satan comes and he tempts Jesus Christ? What does he do? He takes him to a mountain. I remember being in Israel and at the potential area where he may have been, but he takes him to a mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. So some think this could, be, could have been a dramatic presentation, like vroom, 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 look at the kingdoms of the world. Or also from this particular place, you can look in the distance and see some of the main uh, areas and governments that would have been in charge during this particular time. So he took him to a mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, this can all be yours. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. And I can turn over the kingdoms to you right now. Because remember, the word of God does say that he, the devil, is the god of this what? He's the god of this age, which means he can control, he controls some governments. So I can turn this all to you if you worship me. You don't have to become a king through the cross. You can become a king right now, giving him a deal, saying, let's do a deal, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I shall only worship the Lord and worship him only. The whole point was about who is going to reign, who's going to take over the world, what kingdom is going to advance. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on whose throne? David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now we know that he is not literally here on earth and has fully established his kingdom. He's doing it right now through the church, but he hasn't fully taken over the world yet. That's yet to be done. But notice Jesus' message as well. We can't miss this in Matthew chapter 4. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the what? Kingdom of heaven has come near. This was the message of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, And he went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people, saying, there's an upcoming kingdom that's coming. So the people are getting excited, especially because just before Rome took over, there was, there was others in which there was a period of time in which uh, between the Greeks and the Romans where Israel got its independence for a short period of time. And they really liked that. 
to be in charge of their own country for once, but it's been such a long time since they were actually governing their own country. They had it for a short period of time, and then the Romans came in and took over. So they're like, again? They probably thought the Messiah was coming before. Again? So they're looking for this Messiah to come to redeem them, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 6.10, remember the prayer that Jesus Christ taught his people? He says, and this is how you should pray, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is something that we should constantly pray. Lord, bring about your kingdom, literally on the earth. Take it over. Take over this world. Matthew 6.33, but seek first, says what? His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The idea is not just a matter of what you say, it's how you live your life. Salvation is by faith only, but once you're genuinely saved, you will end up serving the Lord. That's just a byproduct of your faith. So Jesus Christ is saying, although many would say, Lord, Lord, they're not going to enter because it's only the ones who actually do the will of the Lord. When Jesus had called 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. This kingdom is coming. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are what? Born again. The only way you're going to see the kingdom is if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You want to be a part of this kingdom? You need to believe in Jesus Christ. You need to believe in the Lord. Paul's message was the same. Notice what Paul did in Romans 14. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking because they were so concerned about eating meat or eating vegetables and this, that. He says, it's not about that. But of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The point of the matter in this kingdom, living, is about whether or not you have righteousness. Not your righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Which, if you have the righteousness of Christ, you're going to start to do the right thing. That you have peace in your heart. That you have joy in your heart. Where does it come from? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that comes and lives inside of you. This is what this kingdom is all about. It's driven by the Spirit of God. As Paul is about to die... He was under house arrest for two years, for two whole years. This is before Paul was beheaded. Paul stayed there. This is the last chapter, the last verses of Acts. And keep in mind this. It's the time period when Paul's about to die. And when you come to the end of the book of Acts, you've come to the whole historical events for the most part of the New Testament. He says for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcome all who came to see him. He proclaimed what? There it is again. The kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This coming kingdom, you got to get ready for it. This is not the end. This messed up world is not it. There's something that we have to look forward to. And it's the kingdom of God. So why do we need deliverance from this world? To be part of the kingdom of God? That's a good question, right? Why were people in the first century looking for a new kingdom? You know why? Because they were oppressed under the Roman government. The Roman government was no joke. In fact, if you were not a Roman citizen, you had hardly any rights whatsoever. People told you what to do and when to do it. They ruled with an iron fist. They perfected the crucifixion and would crucify you if you came up against the Roman government. It was sure death. They would execute you for coming up against them. In other words, if you did not believe what they believed, they killed you for it. That's pretty harsh, wouldn't you say? So where's the church going to be in a situation like that? Martyrs all over the place. Why? Because of the fact that they are not following Rome. They're not bowing to Caesar, which was seen as a god. And then they're in a catch-22 because the, the Jewish, the, those that follow Judaism are not going to follow them and they're going to persecute them because they're not following what they believe to be Yahweh only and not Jesus. So then you've got the Greeks and Romans that are against you too as a believer in the first century because they worship Greek and Roman gods. So everything is against you if you were a believer in the first century. 
but nothing is too different today, just that back then it was more obvious and the persecution was quick and swift. Today they do it in other ways and sometimes it's more of a prison and being in prison, but in some cases it is becoming martyrs, especially if you live in certain countries of the world. You become a martyr even today. They say there's about 50 to 100 thousand martyrs of Christianity more than any other religion in the world every single year. Why do we need deliverance from this world to be part of the kingdom of God? Well, let me give you a true and false test. So now we're going to go into a classroom. Are you ready? You're in the class. I'm going to give you a test. All you have to do is tell me is it true or false. I have seven quick questions. Are you ready for number one? Let's see how well you do. Number one. True or false, this world is fallen and can't satisfy. You, you don't sound too convinced. Let me say it again. You got to shout it out like, you got to shout it out. Is this, this is like, this is the world. We're, we're living, right? If you're here and you're living, raise your hand. If not, I need to call a paramedic. We have a nurse on duty today. Yes, two nurses in the building. Amen. So the world is fallen and, well, more than two, about five. The world has fallen and can't satisfy. True or false? That's the truth. We live in a fallen world. You know what's amazing? What we need to be careful of as believers? We need to be careful when our family, who's not saved, don't act right, and we get mad about it. Why should you get mad when they don't know Jesus Christ? You're expecting them to live according to the kingdom when they don't know Jesus? They have no other resource. They have no source of righteousness, whereas you do. That's why it's not so much about them changing, it's about you changing, and when you change, everything changes. Because God's gonna work in your heart before he works in their heart. So when people on your job treat you wrong, and we've done a good job in the world of trying to bring about justice and bring about vindication, and still, things are still so unjust, don't you see that? Look at the United States. Look at things that go on. Things are still unjust. It just may be covered up, but it's still just as unjust. Why? Because the world is fallen and can't satisfy. Now, you said true. Let's see if you're right. Great job. One out of seven so far. Number two, the world is unsafe. True or false? True. That was a big true. You better believe it, right? Some of you grew up in a time period when you didn't lock your doors. Some of you are checking twice now before you go to bed. Windows and everything, making sure. Why? Because the world's unsafe. The roads are unsafe. You can mind your business. That's why we have to tell young people, you can mind your business and somebody come and hit you head on. That happened to our dear sister the other day, right? Things can happen because the world is so unsafe. There's no guarantees. You got that one right. What about number three? Life is not fair and uncertain. True or false? True. That's the truth. It's so unfair. You could try and make, <laughs> make teach your children life is fair. It's not fair. They're going to find out quite sooner than later that life is not fair. Things don't happen right in their classroom. Things don't happen right in sports and on the field. Just things that take place that it doesn't feel right because it's not. It's just we don't live in a fair world. That's the world in which we live in. We just can cover it up a little bit more, but it's just as bad as it has been before. What about number, oh, you got that one right too. Number four, justice is outstanding, which means that justice hasn't come in every situation with everybody. True or false? <laughs> Let me rephrase it. In other words, justice is outstanding mean that some people have got the short end of the stick and never received justice for it. Is it true or false? I'm just making sure. The answer is true. Justice is, that's why the king has to come and the judge has to come to make things right. Because keep this in mind, there's injustice that has gone on that has never been treated, never been dealt with. Things that you went through in your life where someone did you wrong or someone lied to you or a business deal didn't go through and you, didn't, you put in money, you didn't get it back or you decided to invest in a certain area and it didn't work out. You see, there's injustice that exists. That's, that's, that's not right. 
This is what I was promised, but it didn't take place, did it? Why? Because we live in a jacked out world in which justice is outstanding in many situations. Let's go to number five. As we age, our bodies break down. True or false? Oh, that's a big true. I know that's right. That's a big true, right? Big true. As you get older, your body breaks down. And if you're saying it's false, keep living. How do we know that this takes place? Well, these are signs. These are little signs God gives you that your body's breaking down. You're at dinner. You got the menu and you start to do this. I like this Caesar salad and you start to do that. You know what I'm talking about? You know what that's called? It occurs when your eye's natural lens isn't as flexible as it used to be. And because it's no longer flexible as it used to be, it doesn't bend like it should bend. And so looking at things up close is difficult. It's called presbyopia. Looking up things close just don't happen. They say it starts to develop around age 40 and gets worse in your mid-60s. You notice that reading or other up close tasks are harder than it used to be and people start to read the bible like this and in the restaurant my brother was doing this the other day about a few years ago he was like he's 10 years older than me he was like i said wow that's deep never seen you do that before <laughs> the other thing if you've done this you're at the restaurant and you do this Because you can't see the menu. You realize that's a natural progress of aging as well. You know what's happening? I'm going to explain it to you real quick because it's helpful when you do know something. This is your iris and that's your pupil. Your iris is actually the color that's the colorful part. Some, most people, many people are dark brown, others blue, uh, light brown, etc. Well, that's the, that's the, iris and this is where all of the muscles are around their tiny muscle fibers that are around the entire circle of the eye and as you need more light it contracts in order to bring more light into your so you can see even when it's getting dark or in a dim restaurant as we get older the muscles can't contract they weaken they can't <coughs> they can't contract like they used to so that's why you got to bring out the light so don't tell me your butt is not breaking down. It just happens gradually. And you know things are going south, like I said before. When you wake up and you hurt yourself in your sleep, that's another sign. Like you go to sleep and you didn't have an injury and you wake up wondering who hit you and nobody hit you, that's a sign. So our bodies are breaking down, isn't that true? So as we age, our bodies break down. Is that right? Yeah. My brother said to me the other day, I was like, let's go for a run. He says, what? I don't run anywhere. I gave up running a long time ago. He doesn't run at all. In fact, you know, you're, when you have to warm up, like, before you cross the street, like, you're there, and you check out some seniors. You look at them now. They'll be there. They hit the button, and just as the light begins to go, they do this. You know what I mean? Just got to warm things up a little bit before you get moving again, right? Because things get stiff the longer you're there. You know what I'm talking about? That's a natural progression. It's a sign. It's a sign. Listen, it's a sign that we're getting older. The Word of God says this, our bodies are wasting away, but inwardly we're changing. Inwardly, the inside is being renewed. We go from glory to glory. Do I have an amen? But you need a new body when you get to heaven because the old one's messed up. That's why you're getting a new body. Praise the Lord. Praise. Can we put our hands together and praise the Lord for a new body? You know what I mean? Try to exercise. Try to go to the gym. But your body's breaking down. And some of the exercise you could do before, you better modify it. Because things change. This is real. True or false? We know that's true. We're reminded of it constantly. In fact, every single day.
Every day, we're reminded about that reality. Many times, our loved ones, they go home to be with God. If We've been reminded of that recently. Number seven, this world is not our home, true or false. The truth is that this world is not our home. The reality is that we are in a messed up, fallen world, and we should be looking for something else. But you know what the enemy will do? He uses material things to distract us, to think that the world is better than it really is. We escape with television, Netflix, shows on TV, our favorite shows, and that brings us some form of happiness. And we get deceive ourselves into this world's not too bad. I got what I need. I got a roof over my head. I got a car to drive or a bike or I have some transportation. I can go and do what I want to do. And all these things we've done in order to make us more comfortable when in reality, if we just think about it a little bit, we realize this world is so messed up, so unsafe. You know, you can go anywhere and anything can happen. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had instructed them, going back, go and get those two donkeys. And they brought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them and Jesus to sit on. So Jesus Christ now is riding on this donkey. And then it says, a very large crowd spread their coats on the road. They took their coats off, which is what they would do for royalty. While others cut branches from trees and spread them on the actual road. And they're cutting these branches down, putting them on the road because... Royalty is coming through. The king is coming. And that's the reason why they did it. Because the palm branches were a symbol of royalty. This is what they would use. It was what was necessary at this particular time in order for them to realize something. And the important part is that it was a symbol of victory. It was a symbol of triumph. That this person has overcome others. The crowd that went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So I need your help with this, okay? Everybody on this side is going to shout, Hosanna to the son of David. When I point to you, are you ready? Here we go. But you're a big crowd, so you have to be louder than that. Here we go. Everybody on this side is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Are you ready? Here we go. I like that. One more time. This side shouts. This side. And then we're going to end with this side. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The idea was like, Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? It means save us now. Deliver us right now. Come and bring forth your kingship right now. Would you save us or grant salvation is what they're shouting. Save us now. Save us now. And they're excited about it. Why? Because they realize this is the Messiah. This is the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in. One more time. Here we go. Hosanna. Save us in the highest heaven, because if you save us in the highest heaven, everything's going to be all right on earth. Rescue us. Save us. This is what this was all about. Why they put those palm branches down? It was because of the kingship of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem, as he would come through Jerusalem, and he would have gone through these golden gates, which is on the eastern side where royalty would go through. Right now, it's sealed up. You see the Dome of the Rock, and the Muslims have control over the Temple Mount area. But this is the golden gate that's sealed today. If you go to Jerusalem and you're sitting on the Mount of Olives, you look right at it. The golden gate is closed up. Different reasons as to why. Some feel that the Muslims did it because they know about the scriptures and that this Messiah, they believe, has already come. The prophet has already come, Jesus Christ. So they didn't want false prophets to come, so they sealed up the gate when they had control of the area. Others think that there are... Jews that was, have sealed up the gate because the Messiah, would, they don't want false Christ to come. And so the Messiah will come and unseal the gates. They believe that or God will himself do it. But when they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and they asked the question, who is this? Who is this? 
The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the one who saves. He is the Messiah. He's going to deliver us. And what they're thinking is that he's going to deliver us from the Roman government. And he's going to bring in his kingdom. And he's going to bring it in right now. We are days away from it. And we're celebrating. Yes, he's going to do it. So the big question is this. How do you go from a crowd crying out Hosanna one week to crucify him the next? I mean, everybody was on the same page. Two million people? And you mean to tell me that after two million people are there in Jerusalem, and it says a large crowd, which probably means hundreds and thousands of them, maybe a million or so, are there and they're screaming and they're shouting and there's palm branches and there's celebration. And yes, obviously Jesus Christ is showing who he is. He's on the donkey. He's filling Zechariah 9.9 9 as he's coming through. So obviously he's receiving the kingship that is king. The people are receiving it and saying, yes, deliver us, deliver us. That's why uh, uh, a couple of days before you had... Uh, the sons of Zebedee's mama come and saying, hey, this is John and James. When you come into your kingdom, let one of my sons be on the right and let the other one be on the left. Because we know your kingdom's coming. You are the king. You are our king. You are the king of the Jews then. You are the king of the Jews then. Here's the king. But when he got arrested and the bottom fell out and his own disciples retreated, they had to conclude, surely, this can't be the guy. We thought he was the king. We saw him do miracles. But if he's going to get crucified, there's no way that this can be the Messiah. Because this wouldn't happen to the Messiah. That's why the Apostle Paul says, no, it shall never happen to you. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Because no one thought as to how Jesus Christ was going to bring in his kingship. There was only one guy who got it. And that was the Apostle John. And that's the reason why the only people that are there at the cross is John and his mother Mary. Everybody else took off, saved their lives. John was there because God gave him greater insight. Because of the love that he recognized that God had for him. So who's at the tomb? John's there. Who's expecting it to? He sees and believes as he looks into the tomb. John does. So the reality is this. The reason why they were crying out Hosanna one week and crucifying the next is because Jesus Christ didn't come through like how they thought he was going to come through. You know there are many people in the church who are in the same category. They accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And because Jesus Christ doesn't come through how they want him to come through, he didn't answer their prayer how... I wanted Jesus to answer the prayer. He didn't come through and heal how I thought he should heal. He didn't deliver how I feel he should deliver. And my way as to how it should be done. And therefore, you're not saying crucify him, but you might as well by how you live your life. And so what happens is that they got to the point in which we can all cry out Hosanna when we think Jesus is going to do something. But when he doesn't come through how we want him to come through, do we then shout out crucify him with our actions? Because this is what happened with these people. Don't let it happen to you. He is Lord and God despite what we go through in life. Despite our circumstances or whatever it is we're going through. He's still on the throne. Can we put our hands together and praise the Lord for that? He's still God. So what we need to do is simply this. We need to start looking for this new kingdom. Because I want to tell you a secret. No government in the entire world is perfect. It doesn't exist. There seems to be corruption everywhere around the world. This isn't anything new. This is just how governments act because governments are made up of people who have fallen. And so we think that governments are going to rescue us and bring about a better this and a better that. I want to tell you something. One problem leads to another problem. So therefore, there will never be a perfect government. You could think it's, oh, it's the Democrats, it's the Republican. You see, they're both a mess right now. Can't you recognize that? No such thing. So this whole idea of what we came up with in the West, which is let the people decide, democracy, let's free countries and move away from kingdoms and move away from what's called dictators and, or, or those that are in power. 
I mean, being under the British government, we have a concept at least of what royalty is like, even though now it's more, uh, doesn't have as much power as it used to have, but at least we have a concept about it. And there are many other countries as well that still hold on to a monarch because that's what helps the church in order to understand there's a kingdom that's coming. But when you all, this is what's dangerous, when we all decide and we become the king by our vote and most of the majority wins, this is how what right becomes wrong and how wrong becomes right, depending on the majority. That can't be a perfect solution. So we say, well, what, what, what remedy do we? You got to look for the new kingdom. You got to look for another kingdom, a kingdom that's not of this world. When Jesus Christ is going to come back. How many say amen? You need to long for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what's missing in the church. We're so comfortable with here and now. As we said before, like the guy, getting ready for retirement, making sure we put some money away. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, whatever. It's not going to last. We all end up in a box. You know what they say? When, when the game's over, all the pieces go back in the box. The game's going to be over for each and every one of us, maybe at different times. So what's going to be left? Are we going to live for the here and now, and that's it? Or live for the kingdom? And say, Lord, we can't wait until you come. King Jesus, would you come and rescue us? When you coming? When are you going to come, Lord? Because you answered and got 100%. The world is fallen and can't satisfy. This world is unsafe. Life is not fair and uncertain. Justice is outstanding. As we age, our bodies tend to break down. Death is a real thing. The world is not our home. God's put a lot of stuff in place to help us to long for the kingdom. But if we keep massaging it with things that deceive and think that we, we are doing our best. This is what we do as humans. We do our best in order to make the world seem better than it is. We really do. You have a headache? Take some Advil. Usually you have a headache because you're dehydrated. You need water and there's the signs to say there's something natural that you should do instead of, no, pain relief. I need an Advil. Give me some. And you take it by faith because you have no idea what's in those drugs. You just take it, right? We all do this. You know what I'm saying? We've done so many things in order to set the world up to make it appear better than it is. And then reality and the bottom falls out and we're reminded once again, this is a messed up world. You get some borderline information from your doctor. This is a messed up world. Yeah, your butt is falling. It's jacked up. Let's pray. Ask God for healing. But Jesus is coming back. The king is coming. And check this out. With these palm branches, remember this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. This is after the great tribulation and going into the millennium kingdom. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding what? Palm branches in their hand. Why? The beginning of the millennial kingdom and Jesus Christ comes and comes back to Mount of Olives and goes through the Golden Gate and literally reigns in Jerusalem to say that the king is here. And the saints of God, those of us will be here and part of this number. We will have palm branches in our hand and saying, yes, our king. Yes, the kingdom of God is here. Yes, Jesus, you take over the world. That's the rock that comes and fills the whole earth and takes over every other form of government. Jesus Christ is coming back. Do I have an amen? We need to expect that the Lord is coming back. We need to know that there's no government in this world. The kingdom is coming. And we have to expect for the king to come. And they cried out in a loud voice. Let's say it together. Everybody, let's say it as loud as we can. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. He's the one who has redeemed us. He's the one who has saved. Hosanna, save us now. Not right now. I'll save you through the cross. But ultimately, I'm going to bring in my kingdom. But I'm going to do a prelude to the beginning, bringing in my kingdom. I'm going to do it through the church of Jesus Christ. As our musicians come, I'm going to give them principles to live by so they live according to the kingdom, even though they're still in the fallen world. That's going to be the biggest oxymoron this world has ever seen, that there are people who are going to live according to the kingdom and still be in the world because the kingdom is by the spirit of God. And literally, there's going to come a time when he brings in his kingdom. Because this world, I want to tell you, this world is not it. This isn't it. This messed up place? Mm -mm. You need Jesus. 
So how do you go from the crowd crying Hosanna one week and crucify him the next? It's because they have to look for the kingdom of God. So this is the answer today. Live for the king and look for the kingdom. Live for the king. Live for Jesus Christ and look for his kingdom. When you get disappointed, praise the Lord. That's a good thing. That's a reminder that this is a messed up world when things don't work out. Praise God for that. Everybody say, live for the king. Everyone say, look for the kingdom. He's coming back. So the whole theme throughout the entire word of God from the beginning right up into the book of Revelation is the king. Is the kingdom. Is Jesus. This world is not it. We shouldn't be comfortable here. Recognize that your citizenship is in heaven. Praise God. Hallelujah. As we close. A few days later, the mother donkey and the baby donkey were having a conversation. And the little donkey says, Mommy, what happened? Like a few days ago, I was so popular. People were so excited as I came in. They put palm branches down and they put their cloaks down and we walked on it. So now I walk past people and they don't even notice me. Remember that story? Mommy looked at the boy, little donkey, and said, Son, it's a reminder that without Jesus, we're nothing. It's a reminder for every single one of us, without Jesus, we're nothing. We need the King, and we're looking forward, praise God, to His kingdom. Can you imagine living on the new earth where everything is just and there's no crying and there's no dying and you have a new body can't be that what does God have in store for those who love him let's pray together father I pray that you will help us to long God help us to long for the upcoming kingdom and next week as we look at part two to this Lord open our hearts to understand who you are and God when things don't work out according to how we should think help us not to get discouraged and live as if we're shouting out crucify him but help us to lift you up and to glorify you and say Jesus you are still on the throne and you still deserve glory so work in our hearts today God we want to look forward to the kingdom we want to live for the king as our eyes are closed God's asking you today would you live for the king and would you start looking more for the kingdom if you say yes by God's grace Lord hold me to it help me God to apply what you have for me today then just stand wherever you are it's wherever you are. You want to live for the king and look for the kingdom. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, as we worship you and as we adore you. We're going to sing a simple chorus. I want to be more like you. God, I pray your blessing on each person that's standing. Help them, Lord, to realize that you have a plan for their lives and that you love them. And if there's anyone that's here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and you say, you know what? I have to first of all start by putting my faith in the Lord, put my faith in Jesus Christ. Then it's simple by admitting to God that you have sinned and believing that Jesus Christ rose, died and rose again. And you say, Jesus, please come into my life and save me right now. That's a prayer of faith. That's the only way to get to the kingdom. That's what... The Lord said, you have to be born again, born from above. So right where you are, you say, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this will be from your heart to God's heart. Say, dear God, I admit that I have sinned against you. And I believe that you, Jesus, died on the cross for me. So Jesus, please come into my life. 
and save me right now. In Jesus' name I pray. If you said, I made a decision to believe in Jesus, then just raise your hand wherever you are. You say, yes, I made that decision. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else today? Yes. Anybody else? Say, I made a decision to believe in Jesus. I need to make sure that I'm going to heaven. One more time. I'm going to lead it again. If you didn't do it the first time, you can do it this time. And this is what you say from your heart to God's heart. Dear God, I admit that I have sinned against you. I've done things that aren't right. It's called sin. And dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Jesus, please come and save me right now. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I believe you rose again from the dead. You didn't do it the first time, but you just prayed it the second time. Our eyes are closed. But if you did, can you just raise your hand if you say, yes, I made that decision. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for those who are making their salvation sure. And I pray, God, that you would help them to know that you love them and that you will always be with them and that you would never leave them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Good morning. We're now going to have online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church. And uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online, that God will use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks. Because as you supply for us, O oh God, we're able to give unto your kingdom. I pray, O oh God, that you'll bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you once again because you are God. Amen and amen. Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence, and we look forward to what He's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point 